Good morning, Mr. Hudson. Good morning, sir. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. And welcome all to My Life, My Music, our regular podcast with the governor, Alan Hudson, where we take a trip down memory lane. Uddy, we've covered so much ground over the years. The one ground that we've never covered is your final game. We've talked about your debut, but we've never talked about your final game. So let's start at the end, at the beginning. Well, it's funny, because I was talking to you earlier on, yeah. and uh, it was, it's quite significant. If we talk about leaving Arsenal was probably the most uh, amazing part of my life, apart from the, the car accident, obviously, or car ordeal. Uh, because I weren't going in, I think we've, we might have gone over this, but it'd be good to do it again. Because I, were, I, weren't going into, I weren't going into train. I fell out with Terry Neal for the last time, and I made my mind up that I couldn't, just couldn't go in working no more. I was frustrated because I had the injury in my stomach, and he, he, didn't, he didn't believe me first, and... If he can call me alive, then uh, you know he's not. You can't work with people like that. Um, so I didn't go in, and I was running every day. I was going up Putney Hill, over Wimbledon Common, up the streets in Fulham, and you know where the Hurlingham Club is, where they warm up for Wimbledon and all that. I was running there. They got a track there and everything else, and that was a year that um, of, 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 of of our song Baker Street, yeah, of course. Yeah. But the 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 one uh, the, I suppose the significance song of that time was "Take a Chance on Me," Abba, who gave me so much pleasure, you know, from Seattle days onwards. I mean, Abba were, you know, alongside the Beatles, I mean, probably probably the greatest music makers of all time. In in nineteen seventy eight, the Brothers Gibb, they had five of the first eight songs in the charts. Andy Gibb had two, and the Bee Gees had three. So it just that was the year I think that the Bee Gees, the Bee Gees really took off, wasn't it? You know, um, uh, our deep is your love. They they brought that that was in the charts then, but it, it led into uh, uh, our friend in Bermuda that we covered, uh, the the agent, the the gay agent, you know, <laughs> <laughs> our friend. Well, uh, that, that that's another story. That's a story on its own in Bermuda, you know. It's but it all it all it all like the jigsaw puzzle again. It all fits in nicely with you know jumping from one era to another. But they're all got the same. There's always a link there, you know. Yeah. And uh, I thought take a chance on me was I should have sung that every day when I woke up because I couldn't get a club. I'd left Arsenal, I'd walked out, I was training on my own for about three months, just running the streets, running, going in the sauna, in the Turkish baths, you know, doing everything I could to keep my weight down and keep trying to keep us fit without playing. And it was like, take a chance on me. And I remember um, I was speaking to the, the late Bobby Keach, who was at Fulham, at, 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 when I was a Fulham support, we played at Fulham. And he done very well for himself, Bobby Keats. He was friends with Johnny Haynes and all that. And uh, I remember speaking to him, and because uh, I put him for the Fulham job yes. as player manager. Mm. And uh, Bobby Keats said to me, Al, oh, you've got as much chance of swimming the channel, and I can't swim. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, Jimmy, Jimmy Hill won't have you for in a month of Sundays. He says, he... he and I think it was about the time he tried to get Dave Bassett and all that, you know. But he was he was hell bent on the way Wimbledon played and all that. He said, "You're just not his cup of tea." <clears throat> well, that was 1978. But in 1975, I, I I put it all together, and Bobby was right straight away. He was spot on. He he wouldn't entertain me because I think I, we spoke about a day I played it in a, a match it for Stoke at Newcastle. It's James's Park. We drew two all. We we played. We should have won about six, seven. We played brilliantly, and I had one of my best matches uh, in a Stoke shirt, in any shirt. And uh, I remember coming home on the train from Newcastle. My family had been on the train with me. My mum and dad went, and uncle and went on to London, and I got we got off at Stoke. And uh, I remember about quarter ten. 
I run into my house. Maureen was at home with the young un, and uh, I said, "I'm going to I'm going to take match of the day because I, you know, I want this on film the way I played today." Anyway, I put it on tape, run out the door and went up to my local pub, and I was telling everybody in the local pub, "They said, how'd you get on the day?" Blah blah blah, and I said, "Well, I said." It just don't get any better than that, the performance. I said, well, I know we drew 2-2, two, two, but we, we murdered them, I said, and we had the ball all the time. And I said, do you, you watch match of the day tonight or in the morning? I don't even know add it up on in the morning, then, Paul. Probably um, not, yeah. Yeah, I said, well, you know, if you, and you, if you just get your people to watch match of the day tonight and see your performance. Anyway, I got in at what time? Four in the morning, as usual. It's five in the morning, I don't know. And anyway, I put the... Uh, the replay on in the morning, and I didn't get a, I didn't get a mention. Yeah, it was on match of the day, and it just about sums up how how people can watch football and they don't see the the, the game because they just show you what they want to show, mm. you know. And Jimmy Hill was very, I didn't like him from from a young when Fulham didn't want me in the beginning. It, it was the days of Jimmy Hill and all that people, you know. And uh, my dad, my dad was on the phone to me. Oh, I I called him. I said, "Did you watch match of the day last night?" He said, "Yeah, I did." He said, uh, "It said, wasn't the same game, was it? it? wasn't the same game. It wasn't the game I went to." Mm. I said, "No." He said, "I said that Jimmy Hill, you know." He said, "He said to me, oh, he says, don't worry about Jimmy Hill. Don't worry about people like that." He says, uh, "I've just got the Sunday people." He said, "Len Shackle and give you ten out of 10. Yeah. He said, "That's that's who you take notice of, not Jimmy Hill and the likes of that and you know, these people on TV." And it's still going on today, and it you know they just show you what they want. Yeah, highlights. The highlights are not the highlights. The highlights are what they want to show you because they want to brainwash the English public. But uh, so that that was around that time uh, of, of ABBA '78, um, and then obviously we we go. That was a, obviously Baker Street was that year which is sad. Uh, the music in, in 78 was absolutely superb, starting from the Bee Gees taking over. And it just, make, it just makes you wonder, had the Beatles stayed together, them and the Bee Gees, they would have, be, they would have been at each other's throats. It was, it was the best out of the lot because the songwriting from Gibb was unbelievable and the songwriter Lennon McCartney was unbelievable. The kind of music the Beatles would have been playing in 78 would have been mind-boggling. And you know? both, both got involved in movies, didn't they? Beatles in Absolutely. the 60s and, and the Bee Gees in, in the 70s. And pretty much Saturday Night Fever really projected them onto the silver oh, screen, didn't it? I mean, it was phenomenal. Absolutely, absolutely, mate. Absolutely. I mean, the Beatles, Beatles films were more, uh, more like a comic, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it was more like the bean bean over the but the Bee Gees took them, you know, especially it found John Travolta. Yeah. He never looked back from then. He was fantastic in it. And she was incredible in it. Uh the music was um, unbelievable. And and that was when uh what was it what was his what was the manager's name? Who manager? The Bee Gees. It was, it was, uh, well, Lord Bunbury had a lot to do with the Bee Gees, who you opened the batting uh, with. Yeah, didn't you? yeah. <laughs> That's, yeah. That was my mate, David English. Yeah. Exactly. And, Lord yeah, Bunbury. And Dave, yeah, yeah, because we see the clip of the da- David with the Bee Gees, didn't we, yes, doing absolutely. the dance? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But uh, it was a fella in Bermuda who lived in Bermuda. I, I, his, his name's gone off the top of yeah, I could tell you a hundred times out of hundred, you know. But uh, I mean, he lived that. That was when they he he sat down with him at the beginning of the beat. He said, "I want you to give me, do me twelve songs," mm. and uh, they they come back and they only had eleven, I think. And he said, "We to bring this album out, we've got to have twelve. He said, "I want you to go away and write me another song." This is how good they were, they, you know. And they went outside and they sat by the lift shaft. Yeah, with the echo, and um, they knocked out New York mining disaster because that that was in the news at the time about something, you know, and and they picked up on it, and they just and and then I walked through the West End of London one day and the, through the big uh, music store there, and they had that on full blast, and 
everyone was kind of off tears, you know? Yeah. It was unbelievable. It was so touching, the song. But to sit there next to a lift shaft and knock that song out and put the music to it and take it into the... I nearly had his name there. <laughs> it'll, it'll come to you by the it'll end. Go, of the it'll go, yeah. It can be when the cricket comes on. <laughs> Back to but, cricket. You know, you know that's, that's, what, that's what, you know, the, these geniuses, I mean, Al and I just drove back, and, you know, we, we have Elton John on yeah. on the way back and up there on the way back, and you just sit there you, and you're, uh, you're just racking the brains of, you know, wonder how... Um, Elton John and Bernie Taupin, he, you know, with the words, send the words over and he puts the music to them and it's just total perfection. Uh, and I've sat down and wrote songs. I mean, anyone can write a song, really. Yeah. It's putting the music to it, isn't it? You know, Absolutely. that's that's the key. That's the key. And, you know, it's, you know, all these... All these great actors and film stars and all that, they don't, they don't realise that without the music, they, they wouldn't have a job. 100%. You know? I was half you expecting know? Elton when he um, finished off Glastonbury. He was, he was the uh, the person that, again, brought the curtain down, didn't he, on, on Glastonbury. I was half expecting him to walk well, on but, the stage. We were, I've, I've been told that we were misled again about his performance. I, I heard it, it, it half showed himself up. In what way? His voice is gone, and that, I've heard it from about three or four sources that mm. all the all the media hype on his performance was just trash, you know. Again, I um, think they will, and I did notice at one stage he was actually reading the auto cue for the words of the song. But falling short of that, I did expect him to walk on stage and wish Alan Hudson a happy belated seventy-second birthday because he did well, that at yeah. Wembley. Oh, that would have been fun. Seventy-five, wouldn't it? I said to the one, he says, "I wonder if he's going to walk on stage." <laughs> well, if I was with him the night before, I probably would have. <laughs> Um, you know, that's how, that's how strange life can be, you know, um, uh, you will, I, I must break in for a minute. We, we were at Newmarket races yesterday yeah. and, uh, me and Al, we, we come out of the hotel and we, we were talking about the difference between the English and other people. And we bump into this couple and they, they were delightful. You know, we started talking and, uh, uh, they were Australian. Yeah. And I, was, and I backed England to win the test and, and, and cancelled me back before I met these people yesterday. And, uh, yeah, and uh, anyway, our, as, as, we, as we do in our family, got him into the marquee, we went in the marquee with us. And they had the, the fellow went to me halfway through. He says, it's like boarding air. It was like boarding. He said, meeting you and your son was like boarding an aeroplane. He said, and, and as we walk on the term right, they said, no, you go left into the upper class. He said, and that's what you brought. He said, uh, it's been absolutely, seriously nice, man. They had the most marvellous time. They run out of champagne, which tells you we were good, <laughs> mainly on our table. <laughs> Did they have any Crown Royale? They didn't. <sighs> they didn't. But that would have spoiled it. That would have spoiled it. The Crown Royal, you, you know, you only drink that when you it won the jackpot, you know. Although uh, although you was drinking it at three thirty AM, you were feeling melancholy melancholy me, I can never say that word. Don't worry about it, I know what you mean, Paul. <laughs> and it felt yeah. time that you just got back from a night out with the boys, you sat down at your bar, you fixed your favourite drink and you started writing your book. That was back in nineteen eighty one. On well, your that was, 30th that was... birthday, wasn't it? Yeah. Thirtieth birthday. Yeah. That was, um, and that was all down to Mr. Waddit. And I was, I, I said to Al yesterday, I said, there's one thing I did wrong in, when I was in Seattle. I, I should have made sure that Tony came over and stayed with yeah. us for a few months, and he would never have come back to England. I don't think, because the people would have fell in love with him, uh, because he's the kind of man that could hold hold an audience, and when he spoke, you listened, you know, and he. I don't know if the Americans would understand what he was talking about, but he, he, he's, he's such, he was such a, a character that he would have made sure that they understood, you know. Uh, and that was my only regret in, in Seattle, apart from getting the sack, at, of, of course, you know, but I, should, I should, could have played that differently. But I'm not devious enough, uh, you know. 
Absolutely. You've, you've got to be devious. But, you've but, rest- it, but it's a great story, isn't it? It's a great path, you know, yeah. as, as the, the reason I brought that up, because as the Australian said, he said, you know, like, as we all know, you go down through a path in life and if you turn right, you can walk in a danger, you turn left and you, you're in heaven, you know. SRB Media. Absolutely. <laughs> and walking away from Arsenal, you referenced the, the song Take a Chance on Me. It wasn't really a chance. I'm amazed that no football club in this country coming for you. you. You were at your prime. You were 27 years of age. You were the best midfield player that we got in this country. It was quite, quite, quite incredible. There was no chance to be taken. But there wasn't any takers for you, incredibly. And you did then go off to Seattle, a new life on the other side of the pond. How did you feel going out there, Al, and, and really being rejected from uh, from English football? Which, to be fair, is no surprise because you were a player. Well, uh, firstly, you know, I, if I'd have known, if I'd have had longer with Jimmy Gabriel, they paid 100 grand for me. I yeah. think the, the biggest fee at that time in America, uh, I would have said to him, don't give him 100 grand, give him 20 grand, because I'm not going anywhere unless, you know, they reduce I was said, I'd have said to Jimmy Gabriel, you can have 10 grand of it, I'll have 10 grand of it, and they can pay the club. So they're getting the, they're getting 70 grand off the fee, and that that goes back into the Sounders' coffers, you know what I mean? Yeah. So we could have done a deal that way. But again, mm-hmm. you've got to be devious, and you've got to think, oh, but I shouldn't have done it because of the, the, the grief that he gave me, the manager, they should have compensated me. Yeah. Uh, because I told you the story about, Cup final tickets. I was explaining to someone yesterday because someone sent me a, a photograph with the fat Stan Flashman with Osgood and all that, and they're doing the ticket for the 1967 Cup final. And uh, in '78, when we got to the final, Terry Neal sold the director's tickets to Stan Flashman. Now, if that's not a sackable offence, what is? Absolutely. You know, but it's everything. But when, when it all boiled down to it. You know, I was the kind of the villain of, of the of the scene of, uh, of the piece, really. You know, and to answer your question, really, to you know, when I got on the aeroplane and I'd already signed the contract, Ken Fryer got me the most brilliant contract uh, that I've ever had, and I wouldn't have asked for it if I'd have done it myself. But I got it, and to get, get actually get on that aeroplane and leave England was like being reborn with like coming out of coma really yeah. you know so it was a, it was a and it was an incredible time because america was it in full tilt then the pound of the dollar was magnificent you know everybody i that coming to stay with me didn't want to come home uh you know so that's what kind of nation it is you know or was or, yeah just watching all the shootings on are going on over there at the moment yeah, but, it's a different you know, place, isn't it now? Yeah, it's a different. Uh, you're not safe over there now, you know, and that's a terrible, terrible. Well, it all goes down to politics again, doesn't it? Absolutely. Your first game was uh, ended out in a shootout. What was your final game there at Seattle? Can you remember? The, the final game, I missed a penalty, didn't I? The final game at Seattle Sounders. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, I got accused of missing missing it on purpose. Oh, by, right, the, okay. by, by the by the new owners, yeah, and he said uh, we're not we're not re- we're not renewing your contract. And I should have played. I, I was injured, so I should have been injured. And then they can't sack you. So once again, I, you know, we've we've been through this on your show. Mm. Uh, it's all about having someone to, you know, like not playing for England again. If someone had said to me. Pack up after the German game. I would have just packed up. That would have been that would have been the greatest thing I could have ever done, mm. and that would have been iconic, really. You know, it would have been all, in all the pub quizzes. A twenty-three-year-old footballer pack retiring from international football. Well, people would have asked questions, wouldn't they? They certainly would, because it would have had. Um... Shades of Peter Knowles from Wolverhampton Wanderers in that, wouldn't it? Because well, that's what Knowles he did, and you know his legend and his icon just carries on, doesn't it? Well, it does, but I don't think I'd make a very good Jehovah's Witness so, <laughs> somehow. Um, yeah, I mean, the, Peter Knowles, Knowles he would have been World Cup, Cup 
squad in 66. Ramsey wouldn't have played him, obviously, no. because like Southgate today, he didn't play the best player, so that's why. But Peter Knowles would have been in good company. He's standing on the line, uh, sitting on the line with Jimmy Greaves, wouldn't he? Absolutely. Probably two of the greatest talents we've had, both sitting on the bench. And, uh, you know, the, the, the win at all costs method wins, you know. It, it, it's amazing how people... You know, we started it the other night, 1966 and all that, you know. We were very, very, we never really, you, it, it kind of shows that we were, how lucky we were, but people never talk about it, you know. Yeah. And they show, you know, they show the goals of Jeff Hurst and they, they never really talk about, they do it in other countries, you know, when we won the World Cup. I mean, I was just reading Maradona's book and <clears throat> how we won the World Cup. You know, and it was all about how they went about, you know. But if he'd have been English, he wouldn't have got a game. And then we had the greatest probably player that ever lived, and he wouldn't have got a game in the English team because he he wouldn't have conformed to what Ramsey wanted him to do, you know. And if Nobby Styles tried to kick him in a five-a-side, I think Nobby would have broke his foot. Absolutely. You know, and that's the way of the world. That is why England are second-rate international uh, nation now, you know? They certainly are. Is there any song that reminds you of leaving Seattle and coming back to uh, this country? Because you, you then had a call, you went back to Chelsea, you were not getting a game. Lord only knows why, because Chelsea were a second-division team in those days. But then you got that move for a month to go to Stoke City, and we've covered that in the uh, Return of the Prodigal Son. That really was the great escape. But before you come back, where where was your mind? You'd, you'd finished there. You'd missed a penalty. You'd been accused of missing the penalty on purpose. What was going through Alan Hudson's mind? Because, again, you know, you were, uh, what were you, about 30, 31 at that time? Yeah. Um, I, I, I had no, uh, I knew I was never going to play in the first division again. That was quite clear because the legs were, legs were going injuries were caught catching up once you start getting hamstring injuries and groin strains it at that time of your career it's time to call it a day you know so what I what I did really was I, I moved back into Chelsea with, where my family were and the obvious club to go to was back at Chelsea yeah. because Osgood had been there before uh, and it was <laughs> It was only a stone's throw from where I was living, so it, would, it came in handy. And uh, John Neal was a manager at the time, and he wouldn't, he didn't want to sign me. He tried everything in his power to get me out of his office, you know. But uh, and then all of a sudden they went on a pre-season tour uh, down in um, in Wales, deep deep into Wales, and we we had a ball down there to five, Mickey Drew and myself, Rose Brown. Uh, Dow Jasper, bless him. Um, and we had a ball down there, and I just said to him one day, uh, over a few glasses of wine about training tomorrow, I said, You know, that beach, I says, I'm gonna run run that lot that lot off their legs tomorrow because I didn't like anyone in the first team, you know, they're not uh, Colin Pates and John Bumstead, they were a class apart, big Eddie and guy, Eddie. Need a whiskey. He, he was a uh, he was a good lad, but he wouldn't throw out to me. I'd still I'd still rib him now. I did him the other week. With him. I said, "You still kicking it 60, 60, 70 yards out the field?" I, he said, "I can't do it no more." Al. I said, "Well, you better start throwing it out again, hadn't you?" <laughs> so we, I, I still just give him one in the ribs over that every time I see him. But and I went on the the reason I mentioned the beaches. I <clears throat> I run them off their legs. And Mickey Dry and all the stragglers were at the back, you know, and I, I just one person I couldn't catch was Paul Cannonville. He was like, right. but he was like, a, a, if I may say this, he was like a Black Forest Gump. <laughs> uh, it was unbelievable, mate. This, uh, if I'd have had a, if I'd have had wings, I wouldn't have called this fella. <laughs> anyway, I got, I got, he, he packed up, and where I packed up and put my hands on my knees like you do when you're exhausted, yep. he just walked away as if he'd been out for a stroll and got his Sunday papers, you know. And I looked over to my left, and who's sitting by the on the on the there was a, there was a row of chairs there, and Ken Bates was sitting there with 
a girl called Sheila Marston. And I don't know what was going on there. I got a good idea what was going on. But they seemed as if they were having a little tiff. And uh, I never thought no more of it. And I got back to London. And we got back to London. I was all but going to pack my bags and tr try and get another club. And Batesy called me in the... He, Basically called me into the um, director's box, the director's room, you know, and he said, I want you to sign for me. I said, but you're not the manager. He said, no, I'm the owner. Mm. He said, so I'm signing you. So he signed me all because of that. Because what, he, because what he's seeing in training, he mm. knew that I, were, I weren't going there to mess about and just like most players do, pick their money up and sit on the bench and sit on the ass, you know? Yeah. Uh, so that that was a kind that was a, that was probably another a, a little stroke of luck that goes my way. I mean the the the, the misfortunes in my life uh, I think they far outweigh the, the 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 successes. As Alan Hinton's book, you know, the the triumph and the tragedy, you know. Mm. Um, but that 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 was a defining moment really because I, then I started playing in the reserves. I told you about when we played the first team, they couldn't get the ball off us, you know, and, and that kind of stuff. And and that led to a phone call at Christmas from the man up above, Mr. Waddington. And uh, so it all that kind that part of my life was all up, but I was I was like on a, on a roller roller coaster downwards. And then he he just and the the month loan up there, you know, Stoke Adam won two games in a row for over a year. Mm. Uh, they hadn't won three games all season. That was by January. That was that was, I signed for Jack Stoke twice, both in January around the same time. Mm. And uh, and then I uh, four games, you know, everybody laughed. What's you know, apart from a few people in the crowd, one person had a banner up at at his back. We've got a chance, you know. Uh, but I didn't believe that when I walked out to play my first game against Arsenal, which was unbelievable because I walked out on Arsenal and there I am making my second debut for Stoke against them and who's in charge but Don Al. And he kind of looked at me and laughed, you know, because he tried to talk me out of going to Seattle and wanted me to stay at Arsenal. And I said, too late, Don. I said, I signed the contract. So he said, Neil, you're foolish. Don't go over there. What a waste. But he was wrong because it was the experience of a lifetime if I hadn't have went to Seattle if you look at the bigger picture young Anthony wouldn't be where he is today would he absolutely in fact he wouldn't in fact he wouldn't even be born mm. I don't think uh because I don't know who went around to see Maureen because I was never there to have a cons to give her a baby I don't think although Alan's my granddaughter was a ringing you know spitting image of Anthony yeah but that's another shadow in our family, you know. Who is a who is a real father? <laughs> <laughs> in fact, Alan's girlfriend phoned him two days ago and said, "You you know, she's because we got our photos on the wall here as we've seen." And uh, Joe said to Alan, "Do you know something? Our Stephen Marie is a spitting double of Anthony." <laughs> Al said, he said, when I was working away, he said, was he popping around? <laughs> <laughs> she is so like him, it's, it's, it's scary, you know, it really, she even laughs like him, he's got a couple of his little moves, you know. Uh, so it, it's, it, the family thing is a, is a it's, I mean, I was talking to uh, Alan's girlfriend, Jesse, I was telling her all about is how things go, what path you go down and how things can always come back to your family route, doesn't yeah, it? absolutely. You know, you know, so, you know, so, you know, I suppose I was heading into, apart from sight, going back on loan, um, uh, it's a new adventure, especially if Al goes to work with Anthony, it's a, it's a new adventure, isn't it? 100% life and football is about adventures and you have situations that present themselves and you either take it or you don't take it. So you're at Stoke City, you uh, you left them for the second time, but the second time you retired. That was 1986, wasn't it, Al? Because you had that the great escape season when you come back and saved Stoke City in the 19. 
83-84 season, but then the 84-85 season, you were blighted by injuries and you, you hardly kicked a ball in anger, didn't you? Well, it was um, it was another managerial disaster, wasn't it? It was yeah. um, it was we. I, I, I'll never forget uh, the day we saved. And to listen to the rest of this podcast, head on over to www.patreon.com/srbmedia. Thank you.